Okay, we are live. Here we are, special episode of Dartisans with Dart engineer Nicholas Jeffrey. Hello, Nicholas. Hello. Now, where are you today? Uh, I'm uh, hanging out in Zurich. This is awesome. So you look like you're in a little car. Where Where are you? <laughs> so uh, I can make you a little tour, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know how it's called in English, but it's like a ski lift. I think it's a little gondola. Gondola. I love the Zurich office. It's a very, very cool office. Uh, yeah, it's nice to hang out here. Well, thank you for taking the time. So, uh, some really interesting developments over the past couple weeks. Uh, what? So, we should start off with uh, where do you normally work and what project do you work on? So, I normally work in, uh, in Oles, uh, Denmark. Uh, that's where lots of Dart stuff is happening. Uh, and I'm working on Dart to JS. So that's the, uh, the compiler that compiles Dart uh, programs to JavaScript. And the Dart to JS compiler itself is written in Dart, correct? It is. So that's pretty cool. So we're we're dog fooding our own our own language and tools to make more tools. I like that. Well, yeah. We had a very interesting development last week. Uh, why don't you go ahead and share your screen, and we'll talk about what happened. Sounds good. Um, start screen share. So here you can see what happened. Ah, look at those healthy bumps. So yeah. we're here looking at the uh, performance charts you can find on dartlang.org, where we track the performance of some well-known benchmarks across uh, the V8 world, which is our JavaScript engine, the Dart VM world, uh, which is the teal line on the top, and the uh, and Dart to JS, which is the purple button. And Nicholas, what happened there last week? So uh, you can see the small bumps here. Uh, I don't know if you can follow me with my with the mouse. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, the what, what actually happened is that now we're tracking. We have better tracking of types of fields and parameters given to a method. Um, and that enables us to do better optimizations inside methods. So we know what kind of fields, what kind of types we're getting in the field, and what kind of types we're getting when, when we're in a method uh, for a parameter. Uh, and so the small bumps that come into little, I mean, like this was last week, this was a few days ago. Uh, it's because we got uh, better improvements on that, uh, on that uh, type inferencing, as we call it. Ah, so it looks, uh, and, and what's really interesting, maybe you can explain this to me, is the code, uh, which is the purple line here, that is output by Dart to JS, which is outputting JavaScript, is actually running faster than V8. Uh, now, of course, uh, when we run the output JavaScript on V8, I mean, what, what are we looking at here? How can V8, co uh, V8 run faster than V8? So this is pretty, pretty funny. Uh, I mean, you would guess that we would, we would run at... 100% of V8, ideally, uh, and that's what, I mean, that's our goal in the Dart to JS team. Uh, what is happening is that we're getting pretty lucky um, in the, uh, with the V8 compiler uh, because we're, we are reaching a, a nice, nice path in the V8 compiler that allocates, like, does better register allocation, um, things like that. Um, so that's one explanation. The second explanation is that we're doing pretty aggressive in lining uh, because we have better no knowledge uh, of the of the whole program, uh, and that knowledge is kind of hard to hard to gather uh, um, with V8 when it runs the JavaScript version. Um, Okay, so, uh, so the purple line isn't uh, V8 running faster than V8. It's the outputted code from J from Dart to JS is uh, just uh, more intelligent uh, than the handwritten benchmark code that V8 is running as the benchmark by which all other benchmarks are measured. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. That's awesome. Yeah. Well. So th this is really cool. And uh, so everyone can check this out, dartlang.org slash performance. I, I would say uh, m expect more benchmarks soon. There's only two up right now, Delta Blue and Richards. Uh, and from what I guess, uh, your team is just getting started with this. And so um, from what I'm hearing, it, you're even being a little conservative about how you uh, apply these inferences. So 
what's your feeling for the uh, the runway here in terms of just general dart to jest performance? Do you, do you have more work to do? Uh, we have a lot of work to do. Um, if you look at the, the benchmarks of the, the Delta Blue and Richards, uh, we, co we cover a lot uh, when it comes to uh, doing type inferencing. Uh, there are some other benchmarks that, that we're still working on um, um, where the type inferencing still needs some improvements, uh, and we're working on that. Cool. Well, I know you pre uh, pre um, prepared a couple slides here to walk us through exactly what global type inferencing means. Uh, do, you, do you mind giving us a, a kind of a tour behind the scenes on, on how you guys achieve these speed bumps? Sure. So uh, a, a small explanation. Um, the global type inferencing looks at your whole program and looks like looks at assignments to fields, assignments to local variables, uh, parameters of methods. So every time you call a method, we look at with what parameters you call it with. Uh, and when you gather all that information, at the end, you actually calculate or compute um, the types of the fields and the types given to parameters. Uh, and, and in order to be um, correct, you actually need to have global knowledge, uh, and that's what we have when we compile the Dart application to JavaScript. And um, it's global knowledge. What about the Dart? And by the way, all we see is your slide. So if, uh, if you want to stop screen sharing for a minute, I'll ask you a couple of questions, and then we'll jump back to the slides. But what is it about Dart that, uh, there you go. Um, yeah. Hey, yeah. what is it about Dart that allows you to do global analysis? Like, why, why can't we do this? You know, why can't V8 do this in JavaScript? Um, so what, what's, what happens in JavaScript is that you can, uh, you can download uh, JavaScript code on demand, right? Uh, so you can dynamically extend uh, your application with new, new calls, new assignments to fields, and then suddenly what you thought, what you knew about the world gets, gets extended. Right. And in, the, in, in V8 land, when it's, um, it's a VM doing optimization, it needs to de-optimize because now it sees, oh, this field is, is an int and not uh, just a string or something like that. Um, so, that so that's the difference. With Dart, we actually have knowledge of the whole application. Uh, nothing, I mean, there's no dynamic loading. And it's, uh, it's pretty structured. So we, we, know, we know when we analyze the program what kind of types the fields will have. So uh, for everyone who's just joining us, we're uh, here chatting with Nicholas Jeffrey, one of the engineers on the Dart to JS project, who uh, normally work in Aarhus, Denmark, but today is joining us in a gondola in the Zurich office. And we are chatting about some of the recent performance bumps that he and his team have landed, uh, uh, which have shown some pretty nice uh, improvements with the benchmarks that we're tracking. And uh, we're talking about global type inferencing and what the Dart language allows us to do above and beyond maybe what uh, the JavaScript and V8 can do to get some of these performance bumps. The one thing that I like to explain to people about, about Dart is that it, it, it has a known starting point. Every Dart program starts with the main function. And from there, the program, the whole program analysis can start by holistically understanding the, the complete boundaries of that program. And it sounds like you're able to take advantage of this uh, by doing a global type inference across the entire program. Yeah. One thing I should probably also add is that in JavaScript, it's so dynamic. Uh, there's lots of, two of uh, functionalities like eval uh, and, and new, um, different ways of changing the type of the uh, value of a field. Uh, and that makes it very difficult for a static analysis to actually track types of, uh, of variables. Right, right. Uh, and so one thing I should probably ask, though, is we keep mentioning this global type inferencing. Uh, my understanding, of course, is Dart has uh, an optional type system. Now, uh, for everyone following along at home, uh, why don't you just uh, respect those type annotations? I mean, I put those in there, um, but why do you have to go to a global type inferencing? So uh, Dart, so the, the type system in Dart is optional. Right? You don't have to use it. Uh, and we actually have, Dart actually has two modes for running uh, applications. One is called check mode, and, uh, and one is called uncheck mode. Um, the, 
in check mode, the type annotations actually have a uh, meaning that we will check that the types match what you uh, did the um, what you put in a in a variable, right? So if you string a equals two, we'll check that and produce a runtime error. In unchecked mode, we actually we don't look at type annotations. We just go through. So string a equals two, fine, we'll continue. And that's that's the main reason we cannot use those type annotations for optimizing. Uh, it's like if you see string a, well, nothing um, nothing will make sure that uh, in non-checked mode, um, nothing will make sure that your variable a will hold the string. You can put anything in it, right? So you need to analyze every assignment to that a variable uh, to make sure it gets that type. Awesome. Uh, and as a developer, I actually really like the way Dart does this in that I don't feel like I have to appease a ceremonial type checker just to get my program to run. And now that I see that the engineers, like the guys in the Dart to JS team, are able to analyze my program for me and infer these types anyway, I still feel like the, uh, the tools and the runtimes can take advantage of. Uh, if, if I use int everywhere, then you're going to start assuming that it's an int and take advantage of that optimization by assuming it's an int. Mm -hmm. So uh, let, this is a good time to jump over to the, uh, the slides that you have, because I'm really curious to see like, actually how this works. So can you uh, walk us through a little bit? Yeah, so I, um, I've taken a small code snippet of the Delta Blue benchmark. Here you have the slides. I see me. <laughs> oh, you only see you. Yep. Uh, screen share. Let's try again. Desktop. How is it now? OK, I see it. Fire it up. Present. Uh, and so before you jump into this, though, let's talk a little bit about the, the benchmark that, ev that everyone's talking about, Delta Blue. Where did, where did this thing come from? What does it do? Uh, do you know anything about its lineage or history? Um, not really. Uh, so um, <laughs> so this, this version is like, so Delta Blue is a pretty popular benchmark that, that I think started with maybe Smalltalk. I actually don't, not sure. Okay. And got ported to uh, Java and was ported to JavaScript uh, by the V8 team, and now it's been ported to Dart by the same, well, by the former V8 team, you know, the Dart team. Uh, and it's a fairly, it's, I mean, it's an object-oriented uh, benchmark. Um, use typical object, um, I mean, yeah, object dispatch. Um, so it's it's the kind of benchmark that should represent um, a, a real application. Okay, cool. So this has a long lineage. It's been ported many times, yep. and uh, it's really stressing an object-oriented type of system. Yes. So, awesome. So if you write applications really object-oriented, uh, it should be pretty similar. Okay. So what are we looking at here? So this is um, this is a method uh, written in Dart uh, of the Delta Blue benchmark. Uh, it's one of the hottest method uh, of the benchmark. And uh, yeah, I've taken that snippet, and you can see it's pretty. I mean, it's it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, you got a method with two uh, parameters, and you walk over the uh, elements of the of uh, the um, of a list, uh, and check if it satisfies uh, some constraint, and then add it to another list. Okay, pretty straightforward code here. Yep, and. The next slide shows uh, what we used to generate uh, back then. That means like two weeks ago. Um, uh, so we can without... we can see your mouse. So if you want to move your mouse to uh, point to areas that you're talking about, go for it. Oh sure, sure. Um, so that's that's yeah, that's revision 19850, um, back when we didn't have global type inferencing. And you can see it's not looking as good as the uh, Dart version. Um, there's a lot of checking. Like, here we're checking if 
a call to a length getter on some uh, variable gives you a number. And if it doesn't, we actually jump to a method that will, ha that will handle it. Um, you can see that before we used it, the, the Dart version as a for loop. Now we can just have a while loop because we have all these uh, statements that cannot be expressed in a for loop. Oh, right. And we, need to, we need to break here uh, to break the loop. So it doesn't look as nice as the Dart version. And today what we generate is actually pretty close to the Dart version um, with a for loop. Um, and just a, a, a check of a condition and adding to a new collection. Very similar to that Dart version. Now, and just help, help me understand for the second, the second slide, the, the original JavaScript. Why did, why did you have to move to a while loop and put all those bailouts? So the reason we have those bailouts is, what, is to actually have good performance uh, uh, when running on top of JavaScript. Uh, if we were not to have all these checks here, we couldn't emit this less than directly, like JavaScript built-in operators. Uh, Dart has different semantics, and every object that actually has its own less than uh, mes um, uh, method. So it's not like we can use the JavaScript built-in operator uh, for that. Right, because you don't, at that point, you don't know it's actually an int. So no, first you say, is this thing really an int? If so, great, go ahead and use less than. Because in Dart code, you have operator overriding. You, you can have any object, or sorry, any class implement its own version of less than. That's correct. And you can see that you, I, you actually have another check here, uh, which is always b.get dollar constraints an array. And if it's not, then I need to go again in a, in a bailout in a non-optimized version. And if it is, then great, I can do, I mean, typical array indexing, like JavaScript array indexing, uh, and, and call, uh, yep, yeah. So typical array indexing uh, here. OK, so the original code has to uh, accommodate a very dynamic world, because he, he doesn't know what these objects can be. Yeah. OK, but the new world. The new world, which does a. Uh, I mean, which, which does a better inferencing uh, on, on, on variables, does know all of this. Like, uh, you can see it knows that T1 here is a JavaScript array. So Vita constraints is a JavaScript array. So you can, so you can just use the uh, built-in less than uh, of JavaScript. Uh, again, it used the built-in indexing operator. Here. That is but so cool. Yeah. Okay, so the uh, the the new world. Uh, how did now? How do you actually go about analyzing and say, okay, I is really an int now? Like it looks like that's the major change. Is now now you've you've been able to analyze the program and say, I I know for a fact that some of these variables are of some a point to objects of these types so I can eliminate all the bailouts. Is that, is that, that's basically what's happened here, right? That's basically what's happening, yeah. We have better information of the types of some, of some, of, uh, of some fields, and we can do better. I'll, uh, I'll actually go through some of them. Awesome, um, all right. Just to, to show the difference at some, uh, some statements of the, uh, of the generated code. OK. Um, so, this is the old version. And you can see that we're actually calling a getter. This is calling a getter method on v. And that's because we have no, we don't know what v is. Right? So the Dart code that used to do v.determined by will get translated to v.get dollar determined by because we don't know if it's a field or a getter. But with the new type inferencing, we actually know that V is an object that has a field and not a getter called determined by. Oh, that is so cool. So we can just inline the field axis, like JavaScript field axis. We know uh, it won't throw an error, um, because, and we know V has that field, right? 
So that's one uh, improvement. A second improvement is the uh, is the loop itself. Uh, so I told you that before we couldn't we couldn't generate a for loop because of all these checks, right? Uh, this doesn't this statement is on hold in a for uh, in a for initializer condition update uh, typical loop, but with a new version, you don't have these statements. You're not checking anymore, uh, so you can actually just generate uh, something very similar to the Dart code. Which is oh I'm I'm fetching constraints out of V, but I know that the the field constraints of V is a JavaScript array, so I can just iterate over the length, and that makes it very easy to uh, to generate a, a for loop instead of a. And, and not only is this faster code, but it's also much easier to read. So now the debugging of the generated code to me at least gets a lot easier. Yeah, if you look at the generated code and the uh, original code, it looks very similar. So uh, it actually can make sense of, oh, I got an error here. Uh, how does that map to my Dart code? Um, another improvement is all this checking again. Uh, you're checking if um, T1 is actually an array, and you're doing, so that's the check, right? And since you don't know if i is uh, is in the range of the array, you do a range check here, and then you do the access because you know it's a JavaScript array. Uh, you know that it's inbound, so you don't so so uh, if you you don't throw an error, uh, and you can just access it directly. Um, because of the new type inferencing, uh, we now know that T1 is JavaScript array. We know that i is in between 0 and t1.length, so we know it's not out of bounds, so we don't need to emit a bounce check. And we just generate the JavaScript access. That's huge. And, and one of the differences there, if um, thinking about the original code, is the difference in um, behavior in a Dart list and a JavaScript array when you access an index out of bounds. In, in Dart, you'll get a, forgive me if, if I don't get the right name, but it's like index out of range error. I, yeah. I think it changed to range error now. Okay, back to range. Okay, uh, you'll get a range error, but you'll get you'll get an actual exception thrown uh, yeah. when you try to access an index that's out of the range of the list. But in JavaScript, I believe you'll just get undefined. So yeah, the original Dart correct. code had to match that behavior, but it looks like now you're able to be even smarter and say, well, I know ahead of time if these accesses are actually out of range, and if I know that, I don't need to put that check in. Yeah, that is great. That's correct. If if JavaScript were to uh, was to uh, throw an error when it got out of bounds, we wouldn't need this this code here, right? But it doesn't. And what happens is that you just get undefined out of it, uh, and then you get you maybe get an, an error later. Uh, but with Dart, you do get the the bounce check uh, early, uh, just before the access. Uh, but in that case, you don't you actually don't need it because you know I is is uh, within the range. Okay, and, I'm liking uh, it. I'm sorry? Uh, I, I like what I see so far. This is great. <laughs> uh, I think that's, uh, that's not the last, but uh, almost. Uh, that's another, that's the last optimization uh, that triggered the, the jump, uh, the bump in the, uh, in the graph. It's knowing that when you're doing an equals check, when doing a, uh, so the, the original code is C double equal determin determining. Uh, and when Dart, uh, Dart2JS knows that you're actually just doing an identity check because the equals uh, resolves to the object equals uh, in Dart. So you could just emit the, uh, the definition of the identity check in, uh, in Dart, which is pretty complex, but the, uh, the intent is that the upper equal doesn't have to check for null. Um, so if you pass in null, uh, if, if, you, if, you're, um, if the receiver is null, no, I'm sorry, let, let me uh, revert. Um, what, I, what I'm saying is that in Dart to JS, uh, we actually have two nulls uh, because of some DOM uh, problems with the interaction with the DOM. 
Uh, one is undefined, uh, the, the JavaScript undefined, and the other is JavaScript null. Uh, so we cannot just use triple equal uh, for uh, checking if two things are uh, identical. Uh, we need to use double equal, and that's what's happening here. Like C could be undefined or null. In that case, we need to check if uh, determining is undefined or null, and that's that's what's happening here. The uh, the most interesting is that here it's the identity check, and we don't need to go through a method. We just use the JavaScript identity check. Now, how so does how, kind of, how does Dart2JS know? Or infer that I'm doing basically an an, an, an identity check. That because it it's, it knows that C, the uh, operator equals on C is the one on object. Ah, okay, okay. So th this one, this particular thing wouldn't work if I implemented my own equals equals, of course. So if you implement your own, and the uh, the um, the type inferencing would know. Uh, what kind of variable, you, uh, what what type uh, that variable is, then you would do an actual an actual direct direct call of that method, uh, yeah. of that operator equal of yours. Right. Um, in that in that case here, before it actually didn't know what C could be, and um, because of the way we generate code, we cannot just call a method on C. Uh, if C was to be an integer, for example, uh, I mean it's a JavaScript integer. So uh, or or number, um, so it's not like you can call something on it. So we need to c call a global method that will do all these checks. Uh, but now we actually know what C could be, and we know that C uh, that you're just doing an identity check on C, uh, and and you only need to emit this code instead. Great. And the last optimization you'll I'll, I'll show you. Uh, it's uh, this this check. So the semantics in Dart of uh, of a um, of an if check is that the uh, condition must evaluate to true. Uh, if it evaluates to anything else, uh, it, it it's false, and that's very different than JavaScript, where uh, lots of things evaluate to true. Uh, one, I mean, non-zero. Uh, Non null, non undefined. Right. Many uh, truthy values. Exactly. Uh, and, uh, and 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 Dart is very different that you have to be true to actually uh, to actually pass the if test. So so we we generate a lot of triple equals true uh, when doing calls in if checks. Uh, and and I mean because we we don't know what this method actually returns. With the new type inferencing, we know that all the uh, is satisfied methods in the benchmark always return a boolean. It returns either false, the JavaScript false, or the JavaScript true. So we don't need to compare. If it resolves, if that evaluates to false, then the condition will be false, and we won't go in the if uh, block. Uh, if it evaluates to true, then finally we'll continue. Yeah, this code is so much smarter. <laughs> Good <Yeah>. job. <laughs> and uh, that's that's it. Compare uh, comparing the uh, old version of uh, of what we generated and the new version of what we generated. I just added a slide of what is the actual uh, implementation in the JavaScript benchmark. Oh, okay. Uh, so this is what. V8 has been running as its version of Delta Blue for for many years, right? This is this is the yes. one we measure against. Okay. Yes, that's the one in the uh, what is called now the Octan benchmark. Uh, and this is the Dart version. Nope, this is not the Dart version. That's the uh, that's the generic code. That's the generic Dart to JS version. Okay. Um, okay. Let me check if I have a Dart version close to it. No, I don't. Um, well, I, just I think like we can look, we can flip back and forth between the Dart to JS version and the original V8 version because what what's really interesting to me sure. is how did Dart to JS generate a version of that method that's faster than the handwritten? Which I guess most people would assume that the handwritten uh, benchmark is always going to be the fastest. So I think I think you've you've got a couple areas you're going to point out. Yeah. 
Cool. So, um, so what's happening here? Uh, actually, I've highlighted what is happening. Um, if you look at those uh, statements, where you're doing something on CC and call variable and the call variable, the pro so how to start the um, the original uh, the, so the JavaScript benchmark needs to add some behavior to the JavaScript array. And so there are multiple ways to add new behavior to a uh, to JavaScript array. You can wrap it. Uh, so you, you, uh, you have your own uh, object that wraps the JavaScript array. And you do calls on that object. And you get that behavior. Uh, another way is to monkey patch. That's adding new. Uh, methods to a JavaScript to the JavaScript array prototype, uh, but that that uh, latter solution is not really does not really scale. Like if you start monkey patching in one component of your application, then monkey patching in another component can just uh, I mean could could just not work because you're adding the same method name with different parameters and it, yeah. It when you just when you work. mix these two worlds, you you don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> yes, so. I, so I guess that's the reason why the JavaScript benchmark uh, wraps the uh, uh, JavaScript array, uh, and uh, that in order to add new behavior. Uh, so so the size, the add, and the add under the new behavior. There's another method in the benchmark that uh, does like a uh, it, it removes some thing from the array uh, that match a, a pattern. Um, Something like that. Um, so, so the benchmark, the JavaScript benchmark actually wraps a JavaScript array, and that's what Dart is also, is also doing with its with its list class. Uh, so, the list class in Dart has lots of behavior, not just the JavaScript array behavior. And what Dart.js does is it compiles a list object to a JavaScript array, but in order to have that new bit that that new behavior uh, in the JavaScript array, it used that functionality called interceptors uh, that will hold that uh, this this new behavior, um, and that's the reason why we could just generate a JavaScript array out of a um, out of a list of a of a Dart list, and when you call methods that are in list like um, uh, Filter. Well, now it's called remove where. All these methods that are in this and in, in, in its uh, superclass called uh, iterable. All these methods will actually go through an interceptor that will do the uh, the that will that will implement the behavior. So let, uh, let's see the version. Let's see the version in uh, that Dart to JS spits out again. I think that will make it. Yeah. So uh, so so since. Um, since we actually use a JavaScript array uh, for a Dart list, the uh, Dart2JS knows that it can actually just do uh, index uh, array, an array access, a JavaScript array access, uh, like here. So it knows that T1 is a Dart list that will map to a JavaScript array. So it can just do a direct uh, JavaScript array access. And same for a uh, call here. Uh, it knows that it's a Dart list. That means it knows it's a JavaScript array at runtime. So you could just call a the push method, which is something that is on the JavaScript array prototype by default. And you can do this because you've globally analyzed the program and you know what T1 is. Like that. Exactly. That is awesome. That is so cool. And we also know that all the colors of add constraints consuming two. Uh, pass an array here or a Dart list. Ah, so that's actually a really good key point. Again, when we say global type inferencing, you, you mean not just obviously inside a function, but also everyone, and we mean everybody who calls into this function. You know what they're passing in, so you can make a whole bunch of assumptions then inside the function. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, cool. That, that to me sounds like one of the major differences between uh, you know what V8's able, you know, how far V8's able to go, and how far Dart to JS or the VM is able to go. Based on, uh, we really have a closed world assumption when we're thinking about Dart applications. 
Yeah, that's basically it. And since it's very structured, it's very easy to analyze. Well, it's relatively mm -hmm. easy to analyze. It's definitely easier than, than JavaScript code. So here's an interesting point. Uh, your global type inferencing system does not respect type annotations at all be due to the semantics of, of, the, of the types or the type annotations. So that means I can write a program with zero type annotations and still get the exact same benefits from Dart to JS today. Yeah, same benefits and the same applies to the VM. Yeah, no, that's the a great VM point. The VM doesn't look at type annotations either. Mm -hmm. So the type annotations is really a tool for the developer uh, to do refactoring and, and share some code with other developers. So it sounds like if what, if I as a developer want to take advantage of some of these nice new inferencing optimizations, just make sure that I assign a variable the same type all the time, and Dart2JS will respect that. Yeah, there are some couple of things that will make Dart2JS very happy. So if you start assigning the same thing to a variable or a field, it will be able to apply optimization based on it. So for everyone following along at home, use final and don't change field types, and you'll be much happier. <laughs> and if you have a field that is supposed to hold a number, Make sure it holds a number, and it can never be null. OK. And that's, that's so, so the Dart VM, it shouldn't affect the Dart VM much. But for Dart to Jess, it's very important because of the, what's happening in JavaScript. In JavaScript, when you do null plus 42, you actually get 42. So the null gets converted to 0. That's and logical. And in Dart, I mean, null plus should throw you a a uh, null pointer exception, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so if 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 Dart to JS knows that this field is always a number, it won't have to do any checking. Okay, and so I'm, what I'm thinking about now is when I have classes that have fields that should be numbers, uh, make sure I initialize them in uh, in the uh, initializer list, uh, and or. In the initial, initializer list or in where the field is declared, mm -hmm. okay. uh, it, it makes the type inferencing, uh, it makes the life of the type inferencing a lot easier. Wow, that is a great tip. I was going to ask, uh, are there anything else that I need to do as a developer to write code in a special way to take advantage of this? And, and so the good tip is if I'm dealing with numbers, make sure they're always initialized to a number and don't change them from a number to something else. Yeah, yeah. Keep your field sane. That's yes. what you uh, yes. what we should say. Well, I, I really, really appreciate this. This, uh, this video is recorded. We're going to uh, post it up for everyone to watch. And so um, I uh, am very encouraged and happy to see the bumps that you and your team are able to push out for dart to js So excellent work there. Um, can we expect more benchmarks? And, and what can we expect in terms of the uh, how, how much you're rolling out this type inferencing? So it, it just started, right? It's been uh, two weeks that we started on type inferencing. And right now, it's pretty naive. Um, there's a lot of improvements we know we can do, uh, except that uh, it, it gets more and more complex to implement. Uh, but the, so the, the, we still have the same bar, right? We were generating JavaScript code, and what we want is actually to be as fast as handwritten JavaScript code. And we're getting closer to that. Uh, if you look at Delta Blue, uh, that's what's happening. Uh, we have some other benchmarks, uh, and we're getting close to uh, to the same performance. Uh, they need more work, obviously. Uh, the reason why they're not uh, public yet, those benchmarks, is because uh, uh, publishing a new benchmark is, um, I mean, we need to make sure they're relevant. Right? And we need to make sure that uh, they apply to JavaScript and Dart, and both versions have equivalent uh, equivalent functionalities and stuff like that. So it's not, it's not that trivial to publish those benchmarks. Right. But I, I get the sense we'll see more over time as we get... Uh... Uh, we've tested them out and making sure they're relevant and correct. Yes, exactly. I mean, the V8 benchmark suite that, now, that is now Octane bench, benchmark suite, uh, it took some time to, uh, to publish it. Right? It's, not, it's not super obvious that all those benchmarks actually are relevant initially. Well, I, I like what I see so far. 
And uh, right, you know, dark developers can take advantage of this today. This is this is code that has been checked in. Uh, when you get the Dart SDK um, and you compile the JavaScript, you know they're going to see they're going to see these improvements, or at least the beginnings of these improvements. So this this stuff is real and available today. Well, thank you on behalf of the Dartisans community, Nicholas. Thanks for joining us today and preparing these slides. It was a great walkthrough, and I really appreciate it and learned a ton of stuff myself. And uh, so hopefully we'll have you uh, back again uh, later when you've got other cool stuff to show from the Dart to JS world. Yeah, my pleasure. Maybe tomorrow. Hope we, uh, you guys are fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Bye, Nicholas. See you.